Thank you. And thank you all for coming. This is an amazing turnout. Wow. Uh, I wonder if you got the memo that this was going to be all pornography so <laughs> and free food. Um, first, I want to thank Bill Zawadzki so much for your generous donation, which made it possible for me to work on a, on a project that I'm really passionate about. Um, and I'm excited to share that I will get to present this um, in just a couple of weeks at the um, International Congress on Medieval Studies in Kalamazoo, Michigan. So thank you very much. Um, I also want to thank Matthew Knight, Jonathan, Todd, everyone here at Special Collections that just made coming in every week a wonderful experience. These are great people to work with. Um, they really took a personal interest in my work. Uh, and they know this place inside and out. It's great to be able to just like mention something to them. Like I need a male nude in the middle of a daisy field. And they're like, oh yeah, here's 40 of them. Uh, <laughs> Um, I also want to thank Nicole Gunther DeSenza for her continuous encouragement and for reading multiple feedback, um, multiple versions of my work and offering me feedback. So thank you so much for that. Um, and also my colleagues, Brendan O'Donnell and John Mooser, who spoke with me about some of the nuances of queer theory and recommended some excellent sources for me. So thank you to all of them. Um, the images shown here today are all taken from our special collections LGBT archives to highlight the resources available here. Um, focusing on a medieval text and looking at modern art, I've done my best to avoid anachronism and to incorporate images that will enhance our connections between medieval and modern same-sex desires. So I want to begin with some vocabulary. Those of you who are in Dr. Zisprit Lit course, this may sound familiar. Uh, Octorite, like authority in present day English, uh, is a word that refers to the textual authority composed of truth claims and literary traditions, namely those that can be attributed to a particular octor. An octor is one who ties words together and who is worthy of trust and obedience. But not all octorites were held in equal regard during the Middle Ages. Older texts were valued more highly and possessed greater auctorite than compositions by medieval contemporaries. Auctors were hierarchically arranged, beginning with the Bible, followed by the works of spiritual elders like Augustine of Hippo and Gregory I. This hierarchy would sometimes cautiously include ancient philosophers like Plato and Aristotle, and finally, classical poets like Virgil and Ovid would take precedence over writers of historical proximity. In fact, contemporary med medieval writers were admired for their appropriations, translations, or retellings of older established texts. At the risk of overstating the obvious, each of these auctors is identified as male. In early Western societies, men, to the exclusion of women, were privileged by material and social conditions that promote men's access to intellectual pursuits. Octorite connotes one's participation in an intellectual male auctors through reading, conversing, and retelling manifest a cultural network of homosocial bonds. Men perpetuate texts and auctors that compose literary traditions. Auctorite is a masculine epistemology or knowledge formation because it is constructed by and predominantly for men. In spite of the medieval hierarchy of auctorite, scholars of the 11th and 12th centuries were using reason and logic in new ways, resulting in an epistemology that questioned language and authorial agency, and that gave credence to readers' evaluation of texts based on their personal experiences. Lines of demarcation that ordered the hierarchy of auctorite were crossed as the medieval church turned to classical texts to inform circumstances for which scripture did not provide clear answers. This epistemic shift that was introduced by scholasticism created rifts, whence emerged new approaches to traditional texts and practices, and wherein authors like Chaucer composed their literary auctorite. By the 14th century, poets like Chaucer were merely nodding at classical auctors or even fabricating a non-existent literary heritage for their own works. Chaucer's legend of good women seems to conform to heteronormative expecta expectations established by male auctors. The poem references spring, a picturesque meadow, and the narrator's willingness to suffer for his devotion. These cues associate the poet with his work and his work with Fenimore literary conventions and thus heterosexual desires. Broadly, Fenimore consists of a lover devoting himself to a beloved lady, 
The usual gender hierarchy with which we are even familiar today is inverted as the lover debases himself, proves his devotion to the beloved, and suffers extreme physical and emotional anguish. To the noble lover, the beloved assumes a superlative, nearly divine status as the most beautiful, chaste, and honest. Fenimore refers to narrative features and character development that we typically identify as courtly love. However, courtly love is a term that has been imposed by scholars. While Fenimore is indicative of a French literary heritage, this term was familiar to Chaucer and his English contemporaries. The narrator of legend deploys the appropriate cues to orient himself within Fenimore but he fails to fulfill the expectations of the convention as they pertain to his gendered role. Instead, he assumes a queer orientation to these heteronormative literary conventions. Now, a queer reading invites readers to acknowledge the normative structures upon which texts are predicated and to recognize that such normativity, like literary and social conventions, are culturally constructed and that they are not essential natural truths. A queer reading of Chaucer's Legend of Good Women entails an understanding of the cultural context in which the poem was composed, while analyzing the liter literary means by which the text destabilizes heteronormativity, opening a textual space for alternative, deviant subject positions. Queerness often remains uncodified, resisting nominalization, functioning more often as an adjective, adverb, even a verb, stressing epistemology rather than ontology. The legend narrator's textual indications of same-sex desire are never fully articulated. Rather, gaps in his experience and a preoccupation with male bonds continuously replace women as the objects of his desire and defer his participation in heterosexual conventions. One of the goals of queering is to historically locate sex and gender identities, revealing them to be cultural constructions rather than essential traits of the human condition. Barry Adam explains that while queer theory denies identity categories, there persists a desire amidst the queer community to assert identities and to assert commonalities. We desire a history, and history is an erogenous zone. We take pleasure in our historical narratives. Some essentialist theories generally argue that homosexuality is a natural identity category that is rooted in innate sexual desires that have always been present over the course of human existence. Social constructionist theories, on the other hand, concerned with homosexuality, generally argue that identity categories are articulated through ideology. They are not natural, and therefore there is no intrinsic homosexuality. I am aiming for a compromise between essentialism and social constructionism. To quote from Tyson Pugh, choosing a middle ground between essentialism and constructionism and acknowledging my own anxiety of anachronism, I contend that queerness existed in the Middle Ages, in the disjuncture between sexual self and societal stricture. Even if that queerness differs from the ways that we perceive homosexuality today, Given such a chasm between private desire and public discourse, queerness would inevitably bleed into the narrative record at times with a vengeance. To exemplify this, Chaucer uses sexuality to undermine the assumptions incited by literary conventions in a number of his texts. Carolyn Dinshaw observes in the opening lines of the Canterbury Tales that Chaucer defies literary tradition. So all of you who are memorizing the first 18 lines of the Canterbury Tales, this is your spot. Chaucer describes, April with his sure sota, the draft of March hath pierced to the rota. Typically, the month of April is a feminine persona in literature. Chaucer's narrator creates the potential for a sodomitical relationship between two male figures who comprise the very foundation, the natural setting for the pilgrim's experience. Furthermore, Britton J. Harwood has identified unconscious same-sex desire in the Parliament of Fowls. Along with Dinshaw and Harwood, I am interested in same-sex desire in Chaucer's works. The legend narrator's heteronormativity rests tenuously on a culturally constructed assumption regarding the author's sexual identity in relation to his literary production. His author function orients the narrator within the homosocial domain of masculine autorité and his phenomore literary, literary practices presume the narrator's own heterosexuality. 
I argue that the narrator of Legend of Good Women merely implicates himself within heteronormative discursive modes by means of his craft. His activity, and even his inactivity within the text, opens a queer space within which the narrator's use of octorite and finamor actually facilitate homoerotic desires. Finamore literary conventions compose the normative structure by which we are encouraged to read and interpret the poem. The narrator's poetic style bolsters his heterosexuality, a characteristic that is already presumed of most doctors. Because the narrator employs and implicates himself within the straight, male-dominated conventions of Octorite and Fina Moore, scholars have generally presumed the narrator to be heterosexual, or perhaps asexual. But the Octor of legend exhibits a desire for intimacy that is directed towards other men. The narrator employs heterosexual Fina Moore literary conventions evacuated of its heterosexual desires. It is a structure without intent a simulation. Today, we witness a similar appropriation of heterosexual dominated media. Straight signs are re-signified to express the thoughts and desires of queer subjectivities. Take for example, the hyper macho country song, Save a Horse, Ride a Cowboy by Big and Rich. The song is a direct address to women with a desperate assertion of the male ego propped up by money, power, and a plea for sexual intercourse. The music video targets heterosexual men. But now, let's think about what Save a Horse, Ride a Cowboy means in the context of a gay dance club. The phrase, Save a Horse, Ride a Cowboy, is intended to incite heterosexual desires but the gender of the person to whom it is addressed is unspecified, leaving it delightfully vulnerable to the queerness that chronically threatens essentialist notions of monolithic straight masculinity. David Halpern hypothesizes that gay male tastes for certain cultural artifacts or social practices reflect within their particular contexts ways of being, ways of feeling, and ways of relating to the larger social world that are fundamental to male homosexuality and distinctive to gay men. What if gay male subjecthood or subjectivity consisted precisely in those ways of being, feeling, and relating? Perhaps there really is such a thing as gay male subjectivity. And perhaps gay men's cultural practices offer us a way of approaching it, getting hold of it, describing it, defining it, and understanding it. This gay hermeneutic facilitates recognition of our kin. It allows us to look to the past and to recuperate our four queers who express their identities and desires via subdued signs that, if interpreted properly, subvert the hegemonic order while maintaining their safety. Retrieving our four queers from the past is also a means of encountering ourselves. I read Chaucer's narrator as a gay man who appropriates women's narratives to facilitate his own homoerotic desires. This returns us to contemporary gay men's practices, a scholar scholarly trend observed by Richard Utz as the inclusion of subjective, affective, atemporal connections that medievalists make when they engage with the Middle Ages. Self-consciously reading canonical medieval literature from the standpoint of a gay man, I aim to expose queer desires latent in the traditional English corpus and to validate the narratives and orientations of our LGBTQIA community. In this way, scholarship is a revolutionary act. Bringing this knowledge to bear on our contemporary practices, I am determined to make the transition from scholarship to activism. The goal of this project is to authorize queer epistemologies and to enhance our LGBTQ history. My larger project consists of a queer approach to Old and Middle English texts, which locates sexuality and gender within historical context as they are performed through language. I am interested in literary identities that assume textual authority in defiance of the literary heritage to which they lay claim, and the means by which these emerging textual authorities rupture normative modes of gender and sexuality, creating a new subject position in relation to these literary traditions. My reading of Chaucer's Legend of Good Women elucidates the narrator's potential homoerotic desires, whose orientation challenges socially constructed systems of normativity through literary production. The narrator's treatment of the women, however, is misogynist in that it appropriates women's roles for the purpose of facilitating bonds between men, 
By locating these misogynist practices within broader strategies of oppression, I hope to create a dialogue about the means by which gay men's culture has been influenced by a patriarchy that values women to the extent that they facilitate relationships between men. So, to summarize the text, for those of you who haven't read Legend of Good Women, uh, it opens with a debate regarding the conditions of heaven and hell. This leads to a comparison between epistemologies of personal experience and the wisdom that is gleaned from older texts. The narrator privileges the latter, claiming that nothing can distract him from his beloved books, but then the spring season entices him to indulge his other love, his devotion to the daisy. The narrator abandons his books and explains that he intends to spend all day and all night in a meadow populated by freshly sprouted daisies. Night falls, and instead he retreats to his home where men make up a bed strewn with flowers in his garden. Nevertheless, in his dream, he encounters a beautiful woman who resembles a living daisy. You can see her off to the right. Um, she is accompanied by the god of love, the only one with wings, and soon they are encompassed by innumerable virtuous ladies, or according to this painting, three. <laughs> the god of love, having caught sight of and questioned the narrator, rebukes him for his literary works because they have ruined Finamor. By turning noble men away from such chivalric behaviors, perverting love by inviting crude people to participate, and portraying women as unfaithful. The beautiful woman comes to the narrator's defense, during which we learn that she is Alceste, who offered herself to the underworld in place of her husband, only to be rescued by Hercules and later transformed into a daisy. In order to appease the god of love, it is agreed that the narrator will compose a hagiography, or a book of saints' lives, that will briefly detail the stories of women who conducted themselves virtuously in accordance with Finamor. The rest of the text consists of retellings compiled from classical sources like Ovid and Virgil, with some curious alterations. Ultimately, the hagiography remains unfinished, perhaps deliberately so. So I now want to go into how the legend narrator conforms to the straight male conventions of Octorite, and then we'll discuss his deviations from the norm and um, mostly those indications of his same-sex desires. So the legend narrator maintains the normative homosocial bond of Octorite by metaphorically describing his literary production as activities that are typically performed by men, namely shipping and wrestling. First, he flouts verbosity and complains that some details are far too long and tedious to describe, and to do so would endanger his narrative in the same way that men might overload a ship or a barge. In both cases, ships and narratives ought to convey neither too little nor too much. The narrator follows Love's charge that he be brief in his retellings. Later, as he begins the legend, legend of Ariadne, the narrator calls upon King Minos to come into the ring. The narrator relates his role as Octor to his spectatorship of a sporting event. The text itself becomes a wrestling match that will determine victory by means of the narrator's manipulation of source texts. Masculine characters like Minos are made the subjects of the narrator's voyeurism, even while the text to which he attends ought to be privileging women. Identifying men as both signifiers and interpreters of meaning reduces women to mediators who connect men to other men. These metaphors transfer the masculine properties of one domain, ships and sporting events, onto his writing practices. He takes up the orders given to him by a masculine authority, the god of love, and instead of praising women as he is charged to do, he locates himself in a fraternity of masculine octors. The narrator uses the women's narratives to implicate himself within this fraternity of octors. Then he abandons them in a fashion that is similar to the untrue male lovers about whom he complains. For example, the narrator shifts focus between Philomela and Progne, explaining that in teres leti Progne dwell, and of your sister forthy will yell tell. He does not merely turn the narrative away from one sister and to the other, he leaves one in stasis while his words progress the action of the other. A short while later, he abandons them completely, just like Tyrius, by concluding the legend with, thus he let him in her sorrow dwell. The narrator's focus shifts frequently between the legendary women and the men who betray them. But when he turns the narrative away from the men, the men continue to act, 
whereas women are left in whatever state that men, including the narrator, have shaped for them. So these are some of the ways that the narrator implicates himself in this sort of boys club of auctorite. Now I want to turn to the events in the text that undermine normativity uh, and indicate the narrator's own homoerotic impulses. Acting on his devotion to the daisy, the narrator seeks out the meadow to die by day, dwell in all way, the jolly month of May without and sleep. Similar to his fair weather devotion to, it, to the books, his devotion to the daisy is also upset when night comes and he hastens home to sleep. Still, he desires the experience of being in the presence of the daisies, and so he simulates the meadow experience. In his arboretum, he bad men showed me mi kuchimaka, and he bad him strewn flowers on me bed. The narrator undermines the experience upon which his fidelity to Finamore is based. He substitutes his authentic act of devotion with another simulation. His devotional practice of sleeping outside for the daisy is replaced by his bed and the homoerotic imagery of men composing his intimate space. This suggests the narrator's return to masculine contravance in that he turns away from the feminine space of the meadow in nature and seeks comfort in a space that is contrived by men to resemble nature. This distinction is similar to the, to the debate earlier in the poem between textual authorities and experience or the narrator's devotion to books versus his devotion to the daisies. This also implies his affinity for the company of men. Superficially, the work is implicated within the heteronormative conventions of Fina Moore, and the narrator's author function locates him within the male bonds of Octorite. Although Octorite is traditionally homosocial, Halperin argues that desire is stronger than intellect, and so sexual desire will override one's intellectual allegiance or beliefs because it is so foundational to oneself. The narrator uses the homosocial nature of his author function to facilitate his personal homoerotic desires. Now, let's look more closely at the indications of same-sex desire in the narrator's literary style. When the god of love does finally notice the narrator, the god criticizes his work. Alceste, love's companion, defends the narrator's contribution to Finamore poetry by listing some of his works. Pugh explains that included within this list of literary works, Alsace cites the love of Palamon and Arcite, which signifies Chaucer's Knight's Tale, but omits Emily from the title. Alsace names only the two men of the love triangle, citing the love of Palamon and Arcite within a list of poetry that ought to exemplify Fina Moore, suggests a same-sex love story between the two male protagonists. Although the work is referred to by Alceste, she attributes a romance about two men to a narrator who gravitates towards male companions. Similarly, the narrator performs a ballad that is intended to honor the beautiful woman who accompanies love, Alceste, and yet here too, the narrator's poetic style is indicative of his homoeroticism. He does not yet know that the woman about whom he sings is Alceste, and so he references other exemplars of Finamore with whom he is familiar. In two conspicuous citations, he supplies masculine icons to represent some of her noble qualities. Absalon, known for his golden curls, hints at her beauty, and Jonathan, having protected David from Saul in the Old Testament, indicates a fraction of her friendliness. The narrator describes her beauty and decorum as it relates to the aesthetic and acts of masculine identified exemplars. I am particularly interested in the narrator's reference to the bond between Jonathan and David to suggest, perhaps ironically, Finamore intimacy. From late antiquity through the early Middle Ages, Jonathan and David had become the biblical counterpart of the pagan Ganymede as a symbol for passionate attachment between persons of the same gender, according to John Boswell. The homoeroticism associated with them must have been maintained by the cultural memory as it was used metaphorically to describe the scandalous intimacy between Pierce Gaveston and King Edward II, who was deposed and died only 16 years before Chaucer's birth. I argue that the narrator associates Alsace's qualities with masculine, homoerotic exemplars to undermine the heteronormativity of Fina Moore and to indicate his own homoerotic desires. Closing the legend of Phyllis, the narrator warns, trust as in love, no man but me. 
this self-proclaimed fidelity to women presents another rupture in the text that cannot be settled due to the narrator's queerness. Catherine Lynch explains that the narrator's exemption of himself from the category of man elicits more distrust than affirmation of his honest nature. I observed that the matter of the narrator's fidelity incites polyvalent interpretations. This line has two meanings. One interpretation is that he may be untrustworthy because he is just like every other man in the legends who manipulates women for his own purposes. In his case, however, he does not deceive them as a lover. Rather, he co-ops women's narratives to promote his own auctorite. He can be trusted in matters of love only as an auctor. His masculine occupation insists upon a different sort of conquest, but conquest of the good women nonetheless. An alternative interpretation of this passage suggests that the narrator is the only man in the Fenimore tradition who actually maintains fidelity to women. However, this is not because he is interested in preserving the virtue of the beloved ladies. If his sexuality may be inferred from his intimacy with women, that intimacy is continuously deferred and even substituted by his proclivity for the company of men. The matter of his sexuality opens a fissure within the text that queers his orientation to Fenimore conventions and the homosocial bonds of masculine auctorite. Therefore, he may only be capable of maintaining his fidelity to women because he bears no sexual desire for them. Polyvalent interpretation of his rhetoric is an effect of the narrator's queer orientation, rendering his personal adherence to Fenimore persistently unstable. Now, picture, if you will, the narrator's spatial orientation within the dream frame that opens the legend of good women. Once the company of women has come to surround Alceste and the god of love, love finds the narrator indistinguishable from the women within whose company he is situated. The narrator's spatial orientation and identity with respect to love's point of view incites comparison between the narrator and the women. This spatial orientation and identification suggests that, regarding matters of love, there is a commonality between these women, whose love for men has gone unrequited, and the narrator who concerns himself with male relationships. Let me explain a little bit more about this subject's position between the ladies of Fenimore and this homoerotic narrator. I will use Halperin's understanding of gay men's ability to make meaning and quell desires within a predominantly heteronormative society, a gay hermeneutic, as a means of reading the author function of Chaucer's homoerotic narrator in Legend of Good Women. Halperin argues that gay liberation in the United States allowed for an open, dignified, male sexual and social life and significantly altered the ways in which the gay male identity was performed. Halpern explains that gay men my age, and Halpern is now 63 years old, prided themselves on their generational difference. Female stars or divas whom older gay men identified with, apparently because those doomed, tragic figures reflected the abject conditions of their lives, resonated with the archaic form of gay male existence that we ourselves had luckily escaped. In short, post-Stonewall gay male life was defined by the emergence of a new masculine, non-role-specific practice of gender and sex, embodied by the gay clone, or butch gay man. Those developments betokened the proud triumph of an undifferentiated gay sexuality over an earlier, discredited, effeminate gay culture, from which the new sex-centered model of gay male identity offered a long overdue and welcome refuge. Now, for the record, this is taken out of context. Uh, it sounds very much like Halpern is disparaging effeminacy in um, people who identify as male, uh, but that's not at all the case. He's actually just trying to draw attention to the fact that each generation of gay men has sought to differentiate themselves as much as possible from the previous generation, um, but he's actually pushing for a queer reading of history that really allows um, identities to flourish regardless of any sort of social structures. Uh, Halpern identifies the resonance between gay men of a particular generation with the roles of women because the male-female binary was normative, and it was the abject social position of women that most closely resembled that of a silenced gay minority. Therefore, the lives and narratives of starlets were read by gay men as a role through which they could achieve gratification, even if only in fantasy. Understanding our recent LGBT history provides a hermeneutic for recuperating our four queers from the medieval past. 
Male-female binaries and patriarchal hierarchies dominated Western culture during the Middle Ages, and for the most part, they continue to do so. Amid social structures that endorse the male-female gender binary, a medieval man who experiences same-sex desires could participate in Fenimore literary conventions while identifying with the feminine role, just as modern gay men in America, preceding the Stonewall riots, gravitated towards Hollywood starlets and musical fantasies. I suggest that the medieval legend narrator expresses frustrated sexual desires through the pathos of the women's lives who comprise his hagiography. His same-sex desire finds no literary heritage or social acceptance through which it can be expressed openly. Here, in Legend of Good Women, the narrator's author function grants him access to the company of male auctors. Due to the abstract nature of auctorite's homosocial bonds, spanning spatiotemporal boundaries, this bond can only be achieved in fantasy. But the pathos of his narrative, the tragedies that are propelled by the impossibility of maintaining a romantic relationship with men provides the narrator with a medium through which he expresses his own frustrated longing. I want to acknowledge that I'm reading the narrator's literary practices through my contemporary understanding of gay men's culture, but the systems that produce these subject positions are different and historically contingent. Mindful of these ideological differences, we can observe the similarities or overlaps between medieval and postmodern experiences, particularly the ways in which masculine-dominated ideologies enact misogyny through men who experience same-sex desire. Composing a distinct gay man's identity, some of our contemporary permutations have gone so far as to disparage women and sexual attraction to them. Recently, gay icons like Perez Hilton have founded careers on slut-shaming women, openly objectifying their bodies on the grounds that they are evacuated of sexual desire from his gay standpoint. Rose McGowan is disparaged for criticizing the gay community's failure to support women's rights, particularly when equal pay for women was voted down by every male Republican and there was no LGBT outcry. Generally, gay men are diametrically opposed to lesbians and they inhabit distinctly different social spheres, which is a sad development considering their communal activism during the 1980s when groups of lesbians tended to gay men during the inception of the HIV AIDS epidemic. Some medievalists <clears throat> are still reeling from the recent attack on feminism by a prominent Anglo-Saxon scholar, Alan J. Franson, who is best known for Desire for Origins and tracing same-sex desire from Beowulf to Angels in America. He refers to feminism as a fog, privileging a warped understanding of masculinity that, as I understand it, Halpern attributes to post-Stonewall gay men's culture that rejected the effeminacy of the previous generation. <clears throat> Masculine social power and attraction to it compose a fantasy, and when this fantasy is indulged uncritically, it promotes patriarchal systems that objectify women to further male sexual desires, even when those desires are for other men. Desires seek material realization. Through this materialization, or in this case, textual transmission, we are afforded opportunities to trace similarities across cultures, to produce new readings that recover nuance from our histories and to inform our contemporary social practices. While queer readings of canonical authors and texts continue to garner criticism, it is this kind of work that is necessary to give credence to our LGBT community. By writing our history as one that intersects with the foundations of national identity and literary tradition rooted in revered auctors like Chaucer, we establish an LGBT presence that precedes the homosexual subject position codified in the mid-20th century. This has real consequences. In 2011, the Fair Education Act passed in California requiring LGBT history to be taught in accordance with the state's definition of inclusionary education. Because California controls much of the textbook market, the Fair Education Act could potentially inform curriculums across the country. Unfortunately, to date, no textbook has fully incorporated LGBT history before the mid-20th century when we became a political identity. Furthermore, it was reported that despite a significant increase in the number of PhDs produced with a particular interest in LGBT history, university history departments have not made proportionate changes in hiring scholars to tenure-track positions.
This first came to light in 2001, yet institutions have maintained this trend to this very day. So access to these LGBT collections and an LGBT research award made possible by Bill Zawadzki is the sort of revolutionary academia that gives our queer experiences the octorite that they deserve. As we work to validate our LGBT historical narratives, let us be mindful of those groups who are also still struggling for recognition. Let us openly support the rights of other marginalized people. We ought to fight in favor of equal pay for women. We ought to rally to maintain Planned Parenthood facilities. We ought to march with Black Lives Matter protesters, and it is critical that we fight for the free gender expression of every individual in support of our trans brothers and sisters. The legend narrator was compelled to write a hagiography, a book of martyrs, about marginalized people because they were silenced and disparaged. Let us be sure that we have no need to document any more martyrs. Let us cultivate a community in which each of us is empowered to articulate our truest, best selves. Let each of us authorize our own legends. Thank you.